It's showtime. Welcome fly tires to uh, Monday fly tying on Tuesday. Yesterday was a was a holiday for uh, a lot of people, including Orvis. So uh, we're doing it on Tuesday. I hope uh, this doesn't disrupt your schedule. And it's at four o'clock because I had a, uh, a podcast I had to record this afternoon with someone who was very busy. And so I couldn't quite make it for a three o'clock. So doing it at four today. So I hope this, hope this time slot works out for some of you or most of you. And uh, looks like there's lots of people coming in. Who's tying along with me today? Uh, I, I tried, I tried to, um, I tried to post the pattern description and I took it from a table and it kind of didn't, it kind I apologize. It kind of didn't, uh, kind of didn't come in right <laughs> to, to the, uh, the comment. So, um, I can, I can read it to you. I can tell you, um, I can tell you what the plot pattern is. It's called the tongue head, uh, Duracell jig nymph. I'm going to tie it on a size 14 tactical jig hook. Uh, the bead is a silver slotted bead and I'm going a little bit oversized what I normally would do on the bead. Uh, the thread is tan, 6-0, 8-0, whatever you want. Tail is Cock de Leon fibers. The abdomen is a purplish tan uh, dubbing. The rib is red wire. Brassy size seems to work out best for this. Uh, the legs are natural CDC wound as a collar. And the thorax is uh, purple, that purple tan dubbing, same as is used in the body. So um, it's not a difficult pattern. Um, you know, I, I like to... Um, I like to kind of, I like to kind of ch challenge myself and challenge you with a lot of these patterns, but um, this is an easy one because I know that some of you are are just starting out and you're new to fly tying, and so I like to throw in an easy one, um, an easy effective one, and this is a this is a very very effective fly. Um, I first be, and I don't know where the name came from. I have no idea. I had, I had seen it in the Orvis catalog for, for years and I never, I never thought much of it. You know, you look at some of these patterns and you say, nah, that doesn't look like something that would be that good. Um, and then I went out to, uh, Wyoming and fished with, uh, some people from the Orvis store in Jackson hole a number of years ago. And they were just all over this Duracell, Duracell nymph. And they convinced me um, it, uh, it's, a, it's a great pattern. It works really well as, I won't call it an attractor because fish eat stuff not because they're attracted to it. They eat, eat it because they think it's food. Um, but it is pretty flashy. So it does catch their attention. This fly doesn't make any sense. It looks like nothing in nature. It's got a big silver head. It's got a purple body and a red rib. Uh, you don't see anything like that in nature, but there's something about just like a lot of a lot of patterns we use. There's something about this combination of of colors and materials and shapes that attracts trout. So I don't know why it works, but it does, and I'm not going to mess with it. Um, you can make lots of substitutions if you want, um, but you know when I find a fly pattern that that other people believe in that, that they have a lot they have a lot of confidence in it and I see them catching fish on it, then I then I tie it up and generally don't mess too much with it. So um, that's what we're going to do here today. I'm tying it on. Um, you know, normally I would uh, I would I would put not an eighth inch bead on a size fourteen jig hook. I I generally would put a uh, the one size smaller. Um, I gotta grab grab it here because I can never remember these fractions. I'm good with millimeters, but not fractions. So the next smaller size is seven sixty fourths, and I would generally tie this with a seven sixty fourth bead. But I'm gonna tie it with an eighth inch bead. You know, there's certain there's certain uh, uh, nymphs that you want in your box that are real clunkers that really will get down there quickly. You know, you, you encounter fast water, dirty water, heavy water, um, 
the fish isn't going to isn't going to see the fly that much uh, but you need to get it down toward the bottom um, something flashy like this um, just seems to work sometimes um, and it and it you know it's it's one of those in one of those nymphs that you can use as an anchor to get uh, maybe a smaller pheasant tail or something a little more subtle down toward the bottom uh, but this fly with an eighth inch bead will really clunk. It'll it'll really get down there. And I don't think you even need to add any non-toxic wire or anything to the shank. Eighth inch bead's a pretty big bead. So, um, and silver beads, you know, I hardly tie with silver beads. In fact, I had to run into the Orvis store in Manchester the other day to buy silver bead, slotted beads. I didn't have any silver slotted beads. I don't put silver beads on my flies much. Um, but but I needed it for this pattern. Um, so I went in and got some. Um, you know, there, I, I have half a mind that this fly is, is, uh, may imitate a, um, a just hatched bait fish or trout. You know, it, it kind of looks like it, uh, it looks like an, uh, an emerging larval fish. They usually have a big egg sac hanging from them. And the, the coloration of this thing and the shape kind of looks like a little tiny fish. Um, and, uh, you know, fish can get quite tiny. They're not, they're not all big, big as, as big as the streamers we use. When they're first hatched, they're, they're the size of a nymph. And so the fish may take this for uh, a small larval fish. Who knows? Just hatch dace or sculpin or white fish or something like that. Anyway, um, who knows? It works. It works. Uh, yes, Ralph, I assume this could be used for grayling. I think that anything you use for trout can be used for grayling. Um, so, yes, it should work. And I guess it's related to the Rainbow Warrior. Not sure. Um, yeah, and again, I don't know where the name Duracell comes from, but it's a cool name. So um, that's what it is. All right. Shall we tie? Shall we, shall we get with this? It's an easy one. Again, not going to be very challenging for, for anyone, even if you just started fly tying. So um, let me go over to uh, my materials and put a bead on the hook, and we'll start tying. So I have my beads, my eighth-inch silver beads here. And I'm going to grab one out of the bag. These are slotted beads. They're the only ones that were really fit well on a jig hook. And they, they allow you to make, the, make sure that this thing rides hook point up. And what you want to do is find not the slotted end, but the other end, the... Um, I got my hook and I'm going to look for the round end, not the slotted end on this bead. And I'm just going to, and sometimes you have to kind of rotate the bead to get it to go around that bend and then slip it on the hook and we'll put it in the vise. Get rid of that already tied one. Make sure the hook is straight and secure. And what you want is you want that slot. I'm going to rotate this vise a little bit. You want to see that slot like that because that's going to allow you to push that bead up so that the majority of the weight is above the center line of the hook. That's going to make sure that it rides hook point up. So you've got to, you need to rotate that just to make sure that it gets in the right spot. And that's, that's how it should look. So you can see most of the, the, once I get it, once I get it jammed in there, it's going to, it's going to ride upside down. And I'm using a tan 6.0 thread for this fly. Oh, by the way, uh, Julia isn't here this week. Um, we have Drew Nisbet, 
our community manager for fishing. Hey, everybody. So Drew is going to be taking your, reading out your questions, taking your questions. And I'm going to start the thread. And I usually start it right behind the bead. And I, I, jam, I jam it into the bead at the same time. And what you want to do, I want to move that bead around. What you want to do is you want to jam it against that bead so that it rides, so that it, you know, it, it uh, gets where you want it with that slot facing up like so. So I just start my thread and jam the bead at the same time. And what you want to do is wind enough thread there so that the bead doesn't wiggle. And then cut it off. And maybe take a few more turns in there just to jam it in there. The worst thing that happened is a bead that's, you know, slides back when you're fishing it. That bead doesn't look like it's on there right, honestly. I'm gonna look at that again, because I don't. That's the way it should go. There. Sometimes you have to fiddle with these beads a little bit, so I'll, I'll redo that. Now, now the beads, sitting where it should it wasn't wasn't sitting where it sh was supposed to before again you want the weight to be concentrated up there and then just again so i'll do that again just wind some thread there you don't need any glue if you if you feel insecure about it you can put some super glue on there but you don't need to that bead's not going anywhere because we're going to pack some materials up against it. And then we're gonna take our thread and go back to where the hook bend starts. Any questions at this point, Drew? No questions? No, I think uh, people are tying along. It's pretty quiet. Um, and I think you addressed the one question, which is that you can put a dab of super glue behind the bead if you'd like. Yep, you can if you want. Or head cement, the glue of your choice. Now we're going to take the tails, which is a Coq de Leon feather. And um, Coq de Leon is a, is a chicken feather. It's a spade feather from the side of a cape, and it has a, a beautiful, is a beautiful uh, speckle to it. And uh, you can use you can use any speckled feather you want, really. But uh, Cotillon is more durable than most other feathers you'd put on there. So you know you could use partridge, you could use um, you could use wood duck. There's you know any any speckled fine speckled feather. Uh, but uh, Pactolone is, uh, is very durable. And, you know, you put a partridge tail on this thing and it'll be chewed up after a couple fish or a few casts. But this Cocktail Leon is very durable. Then you want to grab about, I don't know, half a dozen fibers from the feather. Just pull them off to the side till they're lined up and pluck them from the stem like so. Oh, I didn't change cameras. Let me do that again. You guys didn't warn me. There's the Coq de Leon feather. Sorry about that. And so I'm just going to grab a half dozen of these or so and pull them off to the side and just pluck them from the feather. So now I've got my tails. And then I don't like the tails too long on this. A little bit, little bit, not quite as long as the hook shank. So I'm going to make them about this long. A little bit less than a shank length. And I'm just going to hold them there 
angle them a little bit toward me, roll the thread over the top. I'm gonna spin my thread counterclockwise a little bit so it jumps back over those tails. Angle them a little bit toward me. And then as the feather gets placed on top of the hook, then center it on top of the hook. And that'll get your tails nice and aligned with the shank of the hook. And then come up to come up to about that place where the bump was next to the bead. And trim it off. And advance your thread all the way to the bead. Now we're going to grab some red wire. This says this says hot orange, but it's close enough for me. It says hot orange, but it looks pretty reddish to me. Hey Tom, a uh, question. Yeah. Um, why are you using six dot thread and why not eight dot? It doesn't matter. Eight dot would be fine too. It's not. There's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of worry about bulk in this fly, and um, yeah, you could use eight dot, eight dot. You could use twelve dot for that matter, because there's nothing that you could you could use almost any size. I wouldn't use three dot or hundred. I wouldn't use three dot because it would it would, that would be kind of heavy. But six dot's fine for this fly. But you could use eight dot absolutely. And then I'm going to take my piece of wire and I like to jam the wire or just stick it into that hole in the bead to, you know, just kind of hide it and further hold that bead in place and then just wind back over the shank. You can start to offset it a little bit to the far side if you want to. You don't have to. You can have it straight on top of the hook. And then just, just leave that wire sticking off. Because um, we're going to dub. We're going to dub a body now. And then the, um, the body calls for a tannish purple body. And I have a tan. And I have a purple. I don't have a tannish purple dubbing. That's okay. I, I can make some. So I'm using ice dubbing. It has a little sparkle to it. I mean, this thing is pretty obnoxious as it is. So might as well, might as well make it sparkly all over. Um, and I'm going to take about half and I'm going to start with half and half. So I'm going to take a take some tan dubbing. Take it out of the bag takes about the same amount of purple dubbing. And to mix dubbings, it's very easy. You just take it with your fingers and, and pull it like this and just keep going until you think it's mixed enough, until you get the color you want. You can go in various directions. You could do this with any dubbing. And that's looking, it's looking, the purple seems like it's overwhelming it. So I'm going to add, I'm going to come back and add a little more tan because it looks pretty, just pretty purple to me. So I'm just going to take a little more of this tan dubbing. Maybe even a bit more. Hey, Tom, could you mix this dubbing up with a coffee grinder? Uh, Roger Bird would like to know. Absolutely, Roger Bird. Absolutely, you could. Yep, you can mix it with a coffee grinder. But it's pretty, this stuff's pretty easy to mix by hand. But yeah, you could, you could use a coffee grinder. Now it's, now it's more of a purplish tan. So I'm happy with that. I don't know, I don't know what difference it makes, but, um, Probably not that important to the fish, but it's important to me. So we'll come back to our fly. And I'm going to, 
I'm going to back this camera up a little bit. And I have to do it manually here, so I apologize, so that you can see, and I'll refocus it. So bear with me here. Refocus it so we're looking at that thread underneath. I think I'll come down a little bit more. Right about there. Okay, that's better. And then when you dub, I know I know a lot of you have trouble with dubbing. Even though this stuff is pretty spiky, you don't need wax. So I'm going to start with just, I'm just going to grab a little bit of this. I'm just going to tease a little bit of this off of there. And I'm going to cram it on the hook. And sometimes it helps to wet your fingers. You want to go in one direction only either clockwise or counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you go in the same direction. So I've got some on there. And now to get that taper, I'm just gonna add a little bit more to the bottom part of this to thicken that up. And I bet I got too much. You won't know when you when you first tie one of these. You're not going to know how much dubbing to put on there. You're just not. Uh, I'm going to come back in close. You're just not going to know. So you either, that's the nice thing about dubbing. You either add a little more or you can subtract some. I think we'll back up a little bit and go and go up a little bit because I'm going to want to show you that hackle collar too. There. Okay. There we go. So I sometimes like to take a little bit extra. Sometimes I'll actually, to get that taper, I'll I'll pull down a little bit to separate those fibers and give them an extra twist right near the shank so that I have a, a taper in that dubbing noodle. And then I'm just going to wind it. I like to hold on to the tails. And I got way too much dubbing on there because that's as far as I want to go with this dubbing. I got way too much dubbing. So what you want to do is back up a turn or two, pull some off, just pluck it off the thread, put it back in the pile or whatever, then re-spin it, and then finish up. After you tie a few of these, you'll be able to do it by eye. But, you know, the first one or two, you're probably not going to get the amount of dubbing right. Now I'm just going to take my rib and wind it. Lost focus there for a second. I moved the vise. Sorry, just wind it in even turns. This is brassy size. You could use it probably any size wire you want. And then finish off up front. Take about three turns. Nice tight turns. Give it an extra, give it an extra little pull. Maybe I'll go four because I'm going to helicopter this. So one way of, you can use your use wire cutters to cut off wire, or you could break it, called helicoptering. And you want to hold on to the head of the fly and just and just wiggle this wire. 
until it breaks. Go and hopefully it'll stay. Usually it does because you've already taken four nice tight turns over there. All right, so back to materials. Uh, CDC. I'm going to take a bunch of CDC out of the bag. Whoops, gets all over the place. And I'm going to find one of these feathers with a nice, nice full complement of plumes. Not too long. This one looks pretty good. And then I am going to, you can tie this in butt first or tip first. It really doesn't matter on this particular fly. I'm going to do this over a black background here. Um, I'm going to tie it in tip first because trying to grab that really fragile tip with your hackle pliers and winding it is tough. It's much easier to grab this heavier stem with your hackle pliers. So I'm gonna take the tip and just stroke these fibers back, leaving, my, leaving myself with a little nub there of CDC feathers. And I'm gonna take that nub and secure it. Really secure it right up against that bead because this stuff tends to slip out. So give it a, give it a bunch of good tight turns, cut off the tip. Then grab the stem of your CDC with the hackle pliers and stroke them back like so and just wind about, oh, th about three complete turns is usually all you get out of these feathers. You wanna twist the feather a little bit to make sure it lays back the way you want it. It should all stream back along the hook. And this CDC just kind of envelops the fly and um, I think it gives it a little, little air bubbles, maybe. Because this stuff will hold air. Cut it. You don't want too much. Just enough to, just enough to give you the little, a little bit of motion and a little bit of breathing on that fly is all you need. And then, um, Stroke all those back, just grab it with your fingers and wind back over them just a bit to make sure that all the fibers stream back, like so. And then often CDC will be too long. So what I do, this isn't bad, what I do is I gather them all around the hook and I just pluck them with my fingertips to shorten them a little bit. Should be about the length of the tail, maybe a little shorter. So you can you can you can just break the fibers by plucking them, rather than trimming them. Trimming them, um, trimming them just gives it a, a too even of a look. You don't want this this hackle to look too chopped off and even. So uh, breaking the fibers gives you a little bit more natural look. And then the last thing I'm going to do is to take. Uh, a little bit more of that dubbing. Actually, it's the dubbing that I that I pulled off from uh, my too big body. Medium sized noodle, and just wind yourself a little bit of a thorax. That might be a little too much. I'm going to take some off. I don't want I don't want a thorax that thick. So I'm going to take a little bit off. I'll wet my fingers to help dub on that. And then when you're done with that, 
just take your whip finish tool or if you're hand whip finishing and you want to you want to uh, whip right up against the bead and you want to pull down each turn with the whip finish that's going to bury that thread in there so after each turn i'm kind of yanking it down so that you bury the thread and you don't see it and give it a good tug cut it off and then put a drop of the head cement of your choice and you're done that's the fly pretty easy pretty easy pattern nothing much to it um, very effective very quick to tie you don't <clears throat> you don't want to become um, you don't want to become emotionally involved with your heavy nymphs because you're going to lose them you're going to lose lots of them and uh, you know if, if you're fishing in the right place close to the bottom you're going to lose them left and right and so you don't want to spend a lot of time tying nymphs you want to you know you don't want to be sad when you lose a fly <laughs> and uh, this one you're not sad at losing because uh, you can just uh, crank out crank out a bunch more to replace the ones in your box what if you don't have cdc um i would say you know there's cdc is quite special because it's, it's so fine and so mobile in the water that it's difficult to replicate but I would say a, um, uh, a light blue done hen hackle would work. Or you could leave it off. You could just leave, leave the hackle off. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Other colors for the thorax. Yeah, you could use other colors for the thorax, Mike. Then it, then it wouldn't be a Duracell jig. Yeah, it would be something else. But, yep, you could use different colors. Absolutely. Uh, let's see what other, what other questions do we have, Drew? Hey, Tom, we had one about dubbing during the dubbing process. A gentleman mentioned uh -huh. he wraps in the opposite direction when he's putting his fly on the hook. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if he was spinning his dubbing needle in the, or dubbing, uh, noodle in the opposite direction, it would stick better. You know, um, I, I keep having a, I keep having a, uh, a, a disagreement with uh, Tim Flagler when we have our monthly tie-offs. He says, I can't remember if, if he says you should dub clockwise or counterclockwise, but I, you know, I've mentioned this before. I actually spent an afternoon. I dubbed a whole bunch of flies with a really tight dubbing and a loose dubbing. And I, I dubbed some of them clockwise, some of them counterclockwise. I, I wound as I usually would away from me. And I watched how the dubbing went on the hook. And then I took pictures of each fly and I looked at them really closely. I enlarged the photographs to look at literally every hair. And I didn't see any difference whatsoever. So I don't, I don't think it matters. As long as you're always going in the same direction when you dub, uh, I, I don't, I honestly don't think it matters at all. I hope that, hope that answers your question. Sounds like there's a shortage of CDC. Hmm. I haven't heard of that, Jim. Um, do you know any duck hunters? <laughs> teach them where, teach them where the CDC is located. Uh, Derek tends to split the thread and put CDC in a dubbing loop. Yeah, you could do it that way. That's that's a lot harder, um, but um, that is another good way of doing it, Derek. Thank you for that for that tip. So splitting your thread or making a dubbing loop, putting CDC fibers in there, and then and then spinning it in a dubbing loop. That'll that'll work as well, but um, a lot more a lot more complicated. 
but I hadn't heard of the uh, I hadn't heard of the CDC shortage, and I haven't seen any sign of a of a CDC shortage. I think maybe maybe your local fly shop just didn't have any <laughs> because it seems to be in good supply right now. Um, but you know, if you know a duck hunter or you duck hunt yourself, if you uh, if you run your you run your fingers down the back of the duck on top, not on the bottom, not on the vent side, but on the back of the duck, all the way down close to the tail, you'll feel this little nub, and that's the preen gland. That's what they use to to uh, secrete oil to coat their feathers, and the CDC feathers will be located in a little circle around that preen gland. All you need to do is, is pluck them from that preen gland and put them in a bag. That's what that's actually uh, the CDC that you saw that I have here. Uh, this is this is just from duck hunting. Um, you know, I just save save the CDC from ducks, and you can get quite a bit quite a bit on each duck. Um, so if you if you duck hunter, you know a duck hunter um, never throw away CDC because there may be a shortage. Who knows? There could be a shortage. I'm not sure about that, but all right. Any other questions about this? fly a lot of you say that you're just learning that's great because this is a good one um this is this is a this is a good one to start on it's a very easy fly teaches you a couple techniques uh but it's um it's very very easy to do and by the way uh if you want to go back and look at these again after we finish them uh, I put them on a playlist on the Orvis YouTube channel. Um, it's under the playlist Tying with Tom. So if you ever miss one of these weekly sessions or you want to see one again, you can go back and watch them. They're archived. They're archived on the Orvis Facebook page too, but they're hard to find there. Uh, they're not organized, but uh, they are organized on YouTube. So, um, you know, if you ever if you ever miss something, you want to go back and see it again, just go back and, and look at the archive. On size 16 hook, what size bead would you use? I'd use a 764th, Joe, if you want to if you want to make it kind of a little bit oversized, you know, like I do uh, on this one. Let's see. Anything else? A friend gifted me a wood duck. Had to take a crash course in feather harvesting. Got some really nice feathers. Yeah, that's great. Duck hunters are good to know. Duck hunters are really good to know if you don't duck hunt yourself. Warren says, wrapping clockwise or anti-clockwise seem a problem only in a fly tying competition when judging fly against the main fly being tied. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's why I, that's why I don't enter tying contests except with, with Tim Flagler once a month. And those are, those are fun. Um, those are just fun competitions and uh yes uh treg uh goose cdc is really good it's bigger than duck cdc um and sometimes with bigger patterns it's nice to have so yeah goose uh, geese also have uh, cdc feathers would a teardrop style bead work you know i've seen warren i've seen those teardrop style beads and um i haven't used them i haven't used them yet but yeah it would work it would work just fine and Brandon, I don't know what pattern Tim and I are tying next month. We're still trying to come up with a date because Tim's traveling a lot and we don't we don't have a pattern yet. So sorry about that. We'll we'll get one. We'll get we'll let you know as soon as we uh, as soon as we can. And if you want to see another one tied, uh, as soon as this is over, you can watch it on YouTube. <laughs> watch it again. All right. Any more questions while we're while we're uh, chatting here? Doesn't have rooster hackle? Would that work the same as hen hackle? It um, it wouldn't have as much uh, mobility. Flying Seven H Fly Company. It wouldn't have as much mobility as the CDC. It wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, create the same impression in the water. But if that's all you got, I would either try it 
see how it works, or I just leave it off. Leave, leave, leave the hackle off entirely and just tie this without hackle. Not so sure that, um, not so sure that that CDC hackle is essential. Um, Stan, yes, jig hooks do ride upside down when you weight them properly. Uh, although, um, almost any weighted fly will ride, uh, hook point up. It's not just jig hooks, but jig hooks seem to ride, uh, point up a little more reliably because a lot of these things tumble in the water. And, and I do believe that, that I get hung up less when I use jig hooks. Uh, but but supposedly uh, there's you know you can you can cast some flies underwater and look at them. Most of them do flip upside down when they're weighted, but I think jig hooks just do it a little bit more reliably. All right. Any other questions? I don't think so. I don't see anything. Do you, Drew? Did I miss anything? No, I think we did a great job of covering it. Oh, here's one. If I only had one fly to use the rest of your fishing life, which one would you pick? I don't answer that question, Dale. <laughs> but the, the people want to know, Tom. I know, but I don't have. I don't. I don't oh. have one, and and I'll, I'll never. I'll never. It'll never be a practical question. So, oh. I'll, I'll try it off out of you offline. It depends on what I was fishing for and whether I was fishing for fun or for food. And, uh, you know, I don't have a favorite. I actually don't have a favorite fly pad. And the favorite, my favorite fly pad is usually the one I have on that's catching fish. The hook is traveling upside down. The, the hook point is riding away from the bottom. So it's less likely to, to hang up. And yes, this will be on YouTube, Fred. I think Warren answered the question to your uh, fly that uh, you'll have to pick for the rest of your life. You have to buy all of Tom's books and um, decode the messages in Tom's books to learn Tom's favorite fly. That's the I do. I do have uh, my, my 10... Uh, most reliable trout patterns for using anywhere in the world. It's on YouTube. It's under the, it's in the learnings, it's in the learning center. It's on, it's in the prospecting for trout section. And um, it's called top 10 flies or something like that. So if you want to know what 10 flies I would recommend for anywhere in the world, no matter where you're going, uh, you can go to the Orvis learning center and check that out but i'm not going to tell you here because i don't even remember what they were and it changes every week anyways so okay well thank you everyone um we're really glad you're here it was it was a lot of fun for us uh, oh thank you drew you found the top 10 flies Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, thanks for thanks for coming today. I'm glad that some of you tied along. If this is your first time here, welcome. Um, we do this typically every Monday. Sometimes we have to switch days, but we typically do it Monday at 3 p.m. And um, we have a lot of fun. Don't be afraid to tease me. Um, I can take it. So, uh, and a lot of the a lot of the regulars here know that. So, anyway. Um, we will see you, I think we are on Monday next week, and we're going to be tying the, a small nymph, uh, the flaming, flaming pheasant. It's a, uh, glass bead, uh, uh, dark, uh, dark pheasant tail, black pheasant tail with a red glass bead on it, um, in size 18. So it's, it's something that you'd want to hang behind something heavy like this because it has a glass bead. It's not going to sink. It's not going to sink as fast as something with a tungsten bead, um, but you can you can hang in hang it on a, a bigger nymph, or you can fish it with split shot to get it down, or fish it shallow and and don't sink it so much because sometimes that's effective. All right, everyone, thanks for coming in today, and um, I'll see you next Monday.